this morning, uh, we just want to, I just want to share a little on the message that I worked on this week for you. When Jesus was thankful, um, when Jesus was thankful, and <clears throat> we're not going to read the scripture again because I want to cut on time, um, but there are two times in which two occasions, at least two recorded occasions, when Jesus gave uh, broke bread and fed a multitude. And I deliberately had the scripture read today about the seven loaves and fishes feeding 4,000 people. Because some, some of you might be saying, hold on a minute, that's not the five loaves and two fishes and 5,000. It just so happened there are two miracles and sometimes we forget the other one. We forget the second one, right? But there are two occasions in which Jesus fed 5,000 and then 4,000. Just men. That's the men number, not the women. And we know where men are. You probably have twice as well as much women. Um, if we look at how churches are these days, you probably had much more people uh, with children. Who knows how many, maybe close to 10,000 people. But one thing was common between both of those miracles. The performance of it, and we are going to talk a little about that in a moment. But it's Thanksgiving Day in Canada, um, November the last Thursday, U.S. will celebrate theirs, but we are giving thanks before them, because we are honoring God before everybody else. Amen. And so we want to be thankful, not just today, we want to be thankful um, always, uh, because this is what God expects of us. Amen? I remember seeing a few years back an episode of The Simpsons in which they're sitting at their Thanksgiving table um, and uh, Bart Simpson is all upset. He's angry and, uh, you know, Marge says, well, today's the day for us to be thankful and, uh, and he says, he pouts and he says, what is there to be thankful for? He's probably upset over something wasn't going his way. Well, you know, the truth is a lot of people are asking the same. What is there to be thankful for? What is there to be thankful for? A lot of people are saying things are not working out for me. What is there to be thankful for? And so I want to, and the thing is, you know, Paul knew, or by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, knew that in the last days, this will become a part of uh, human lifestyle. Take, for example, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 2. This is what he says, in the last days, perilous times will come. And he's talking to Timothy. He's talking to a young uh, preacher, a young pastor, right, who he's mentoring. And men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unthankful. We wouldn't, this word seems like out of place in that sentence. All the others we would talk about are like sins that are heinous, sins that, um, you know, we ourselves would abhor. And no one would think about unthankful, but he slots this word in and gives it say, the same degree of strength and power as the others, as the other items that he lists, and there's some more that he lists in, uh, as we move forward. Into, but unthankfulness is going to be part of uh, a systemic part of society and, and even many Christians, Christian lives. But we are expected to go against the grain of ingratitude. You and I are not supposed to be among that list. We are supposed to be in the list that says, no matter what happens, we are going to be thankful. This is what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. In everything, give thanks. Not when just things are good, when things are bright, when everything is going favorably for us. But in everything, give thanks. For this is God's will in Christ Jesus for you. The implication here is simple. God is in control. And hence, nothing can come our way or nothing can happen to us 
unless he permits it. And if he permits it, he's going to deliver us. And he's going to work something beautiful out of it in our lives. This is what Romans 8.28 says. And we know that all things work together for good to them who love the Lord. All things. Good things, bad things, ugly things, adverse things. All things in this whole mishmash, God takes it like, like dough and he works it out. And beautiful things come out of it. Our brokenness, our, our adversities, our suffering and our pain, coupled with our blessings and, and, and all the good things in our lives, all of it is part and parcel of God's doing in our lives to make something beautiful. All things work together for good to them who love the Lord. And are called according to his purpose. It is indeed challenging when we are asked to be thankful when faced with financial hardships, separation from loved ones through distance, death, or divorce, and when we are always fighting for our health and wellness. Yet through it all, God wants us to be thankful. And in Jesus, his son, he demonstrates how gratitude can be expressed amid extreme hardship, suffering, and rejection. And that's why today I want to talk about when Jesus was thankful. Because Jesus is not only our Savior, but he's the template. He's the template that God has set forth for humanity. He's the model. He's the paradigm. He's the one who has come to live life, not just for us, but as an example to us of what is possible. We need to understand this. Many Christians say, oh, Jesus walked in the water. Um, he, he calmed the storms. He opened blind eyes and did all these amazing things because he's the son of God. Meaning that he has a, a power that you and I don't have and hence, we are not expected to be able to do what Jesus did. That is a lie from the pits of hell. Jesus was a man approved of God. He suspended the use of his divinity in order to redeem humanity. In order to redeem humanity, he had to be made fully man. This is why Paul speaks of him as the last Adam. The first Adam, through his disobedience, caused the fall of humanity. For redemption to happen, whoever wants a rematch must come under the same condition as Adam did. Must be made like Adam. Must be another Adam. And I thank God that Jesus is not the second Adam, which many books have. The Bible says he's the last Adam. I'm glad he's the last Adam. Can somebody say amen? Not the second Adam. Because there are people and their religions who are telling us that Jesus is not the final messenger from God, that there are other messengers came. But I'm glad that Jesus is the last Adam. No more room for anybody else. Amen. And so Jesus has come and he made it clear that everything he did from raising the dead, calming the storms, everything else, he made it clear as to how he did it. As he opened his ministry, he stood at that pul pulpit in that synagogue and he read Isaiah and he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to do this, to liberate, to heal, to mend broken hearts, and only the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. When Jesus cast out a demon, he did not do it because he's the Son of God. He did it as a man anointed of God. He said, if I, by the finger of God, cast out demons, then the kingdom has come to you. Who's the finger of God? The Holy Spirit. Everything he did was by the power of the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, you and I received the same Holy Spirit. Not a part of the Holy Spirit. Not 25% of him. There is no division of God. We either receive God holy or not at all. So when we receive the Holy Spirit... We receive the same power and potential that Jesus had. 
This is why before he left, he said, the works that I do, you will do also. And greater works you will do because I go to be with the Father. What happens when he went to be with the Father? He sent the Holy Spirit. The problem is not the lack of is the power. The problem is our, is our commitment to receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Being baptized in the Holy Spirit is one thing. Walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit every day is another thing. Do you know why Jesus was able to do everything that he did and why we lack that kind of power? It is not that we don't have the anointing, but we don't have the anointing in the, in the, at the level that Jesus carried in. Here is what he says. The scripture tells us, because you have loved righteousness and hated iniquity, therefore your God has anointed you with oil above your companions. Your anointing is so great upon your life because of two things. You love righteousness and you hate iniquity. Now when I meditate upon this today, I'm always thinking about how we are. Many of us as Christians, we love righteousness. We like to hear the things of God. We like to do good. We like to walk in purity. We love righteousness. But do we hate lawlessness? That's another question. Do we hate iniquity? Iniquity means lawlessness. I find Christians are absorbed and immersed in, in, in the lawlessness, much of the lawlessness that takes place in our time. You know, and, and I wonder if those things do not impact uh, our anointing upon our lives as well. Anyways, that's beside the point. I want to make the point that whatever Jesus did, he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you and I have the capacity to increase our anointing to get it to that point where we can do the works of Jesus and the greater works that he said we will do. Amen. So, I want to look at this man's life a little bit. Um, and then I will draw from that. Today we are talking about when Jesus was thankful. Let's take a quick look at the life of this man um, and draw some lessons about what made him so powerful, what made him so effective, um, what made him so joyful? Uh, first, we look at just outline, drop the outlines for all of them. Uh, look, at, look at him, where he was born. You and I, most of us, are born in a better place than Jesus was. I don't, anybody here uh, was born in, in, among animals? Well, I don't think we were. I don't think any of us, we all probably are born either at home or um, in a hospital, right? Uh, we were born in a pleasant place. And maybe pictures were taken and, and gifts were brought and all of these different things. Um, Jesus, this is where he came, born in a manger. Look at where he was raised. He was raised in Nazareth. When the disciple came to Nathaniel, and said, come, we have found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Nathaniel was like, seriously? What good can come from Nazareth? What good can come from Nazareth? This is the question he asked. And the reason he asked that question is because Nazareth was literally the red light district of Palestine. Nazareth was the place where the Roman soldiers were encamped. And they came in and all the prostitutes and all of these, the, the, the places of um, liquor and, and, and carousing and everything. This is what Nazareth was. And this is the place that Jesus grew up in. He grew up among drunkards. He grew up among prostitutes. If you look at the story in the gospel, you will see Jesus' acquaintance with these people. He was accused for being friends of sinners. But these are the people he grew up among. He grew up in Nazareth. 
Look at how he lived, homeless and hungry for most of the time. You know, um, I know there are people who try to say um, tour guides in Israel take Christians around and try to make Jesus out to be uh, some kind of middle class artisan, you know, that carpentry was um, a, a, a kind of a very profitable endeavor and Jesus lived a middle class life in, in, a, in, you know, had a nice house and all of these things. None of that is borne out by scripture. None of it. None of it. If you want to know more about that, I wrote a book called uh, The Hell Jesus Went Through for Me. And part one chapter is about the poverty of Jesus. Uh, you can read that and, and get this. But he was, this is a man who said, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. But a son of man has nowhere to lay his head. This is not being figurative. This is being literal. He's talking about foxes have holes. That's something very literal. That's where they live. That's their house. Birds of the air have nests. That's, their, that's very literal. That's where they live. They have nests. The son of man has nowhere to lay his head. We're not going to move from literal to figurative. He's talking about his situation. The way it was. He is always hungry. This is the man who's searching for a fruit and a fig tree. This is a man who drops in to Bethany to Mary and Martha and Lazarus for something to eat. This is a man who, for the most part, seems like, like he was fasting more than he was eating. Um, homeless and hungry is what he was. Jesus did not even have enough money to pay his taxes. When the tax man came and, uh, and said, hey, you have a liability, you have to pay your taxes, he said, he turned to, to one of the disciples and said, can you help me out? I'm just reading through the scriptures between the lines. And the disciple said, no, I don't have money either. He said, all right, go and cast a, a line out there and um, a fish will bring our taxes. And there, that fish comes, and, and this is a story that we could spend all day talking about. Fishes don't eat coins. They either eat other fishes or plankton or some little thing floating about. This fish actually had to go to some shipwreck, pick up this coin, make sure he sorted out through all the coins that are there to get the exact amount of the taxes that are due. Pick up that coin and bring it and get himself hooked into that, into that line to bring up that tax. And the tax payment was enough for Jesus and his disciples. So if you can't pay your bills, learn how to find a fish. <laughs> you can't pay a, a bills, trust God. That's, that's what it is. A fish is hanging around. Somebody's waiting with the resource to bring to us. Yeah. Amen. Praise God. Jesus, when he came to the end, he did not even, was able, he had put the Uber a donkey. <laughs> he had to borrow a donkey, sending his disciples, go up the hill, you'll find a young donkey tied there, ask the owner, and he will give it to you. Tell him the master has need of it. The donkey came and took him into the city. At his death, he did not have anyone to give him a grave, to bury him. He had to borrow a grave from a rich man. And at his crucifixion, he did not even have to write a will because he had nothing left to give. The one piece of garment stained with blood, taken off of him at the crucifixion site, the soldiers gambled for him. That's all. This is a man who lived and died empty, who trusted the Father every day for his support. A man like this, born under such circumstances, raised in such um, 
but environment is Nazareth. Always without resources that would probably give him a little more comfortable life. This is the man who is our savior. This is the man who changed the world. And this is the man who, if many of us find ourselves in this kind of condition that he was in, would be like Bart Simpson, find it very difficult to be thankful. Like Bart Simpson, somebody in this situation would look at their lives, look at their ancestry, look at their circumstances, consider all the suffering, the difficulty, and they would ask what is there to be thankful for. Was Jesus thankful? I want to just touch on a few areas to show how in spite of this kind of harsh life and experience that Jesus went through, he never failed to be grateful for life. Let's go to the first. Be thankful for the little we have. We have more than most people. And gratitude is a multiplier. I got that last line while I was taking a sip of my coffee and Tim Hortons working on this message. Gratitude is a multiplier. In both cases, when Jesus shared bread, before he shared that bread, in one case, five loaves and two fishes, in another case, seven loaves and a couple of fishes. Jesus loved fish and bread. After he rose from the dead, he met his disciples. Do you know what he asked for? Fish and bread. He loved fish and bread. If you like fish and bread, you're like, you're, 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 you have, an, you have a diet, dietary uh, appetite like Jesus. But in both cases, Jesus looked at his multitude. I'm like, how, how in the world does five loaves or seven loaves feed all of these people? And then he found the answer. He gave thanks. Note, he didn't break and give thanks. He broke, then give thanks. He broke the bread. He gave thanks, then broke the bread. And as he began to break, it began to multiply. Gratitude multiplies. It follows that an ungrateful heart depletes our resources. Amen? When we are ungrateful, when we are unthankful for what we have, the little we have reduces. The mathematics works both ways. If gratitude multiplies, then gratitude will reduce the, li the little, that we, even the little that we have. So these stories think, taught us something important about how Jesus was able to navigate life despite the paucity of resources that was able to that was available to him. With a thankful heart, he was able to increase what he had. Amen. Gratitude is a multiplier. Say that with me. Gratitude is a multiplier. Amen. So have a grateful heart, not a discontented heart, not a complaining heart, not a heart that always finds the negative in situations but looks for the positive. There is always a silver lining behind every dark cloud. Can somebody say that? Amen. We learned that when we were in primary school. Behind every dark cloud is a silver lining. Don't allow the, the dark cloud to get you into a place of despair, fear, anxiety, and worry that you can't see beyond to see that silver lining. There is always a silver lining, something wonderful, something glorious, something beautiful that is hiding behind this facade. Dark clouds always roll away. You know that? They always move away. They are only there temporarily. They only blind our, our eyes to the beautiful light and beauty beyond for a moment. But if we just look at the dark clouds, 
and you know, just lament life, then things are not going to work. We are not going to see the beauty that lies behind. Second, be thankful to God for opening our eyes to see Jesus as Lord and giving us the spirit to aid our understanding of heavenly truths. It's warm in here. If you have a, some water, you can take a sip. All right, you can follow me. And uh, We don't want you to faint. There's some water up there. If uh, anybody needs, please help yourself. Thankfulness. Um, we ought to be thankful because of revelation. I think we take it for granted that we are Christians and how we became Christians. You and I, wherever you were converted, whether it's an open air street meeting or in a church or a friend that you think meets somewhere, um, it does matter. But think about it. You were probably a church, a crusade, an open air meeting. The same message was heard by maybe 50, 100 people. And when that altar call was made, maybe five or 10 people out of the 100 went up to that altar and surrendered to Jesus. You know what happened? The eyes of those five or 10 people were opened to see something beautiful something wonderful that was hidden from the eyes of the others that they couldn't see. You and I are here because God opened our eyes and we saw Jesus Christ as Lord. How is it that we've given our hearts and our lives to a man we never saw? How is it that we are prepared to die for somebody we never met? How is it that you and I would lay down our lives, hopefully, for Jesus? A man who we've never met, whom we've ever seen, certainly not physically, and whom we have served, and things were not always rosy for us. For the most part, we went, we, we suffered and we hardship more than the blessings we receive because this world is not our own. This is world is governed by a prince or the God of this age. And so you and I are strangers and pilgrims in this world. Yet in spite of all of that, we continue to embrace Jesus and would gladly give our lives for his cause. Why? Because God has opened to us things that many others cannot see. And Jesus wants us, wants us to be appreciative of this. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. How many are not stumbling over the gospel? Saying, the preaching of the gospel is foolishness to them that, that perish. How many are not in this place where the gospel is, is a stumbling block to them? Yet to us, it is the power of God. Hallelujah. We cherish the gospel. The same thing that is despised and, and condemned and criticized by millions. You and I read and we enjoy and we say, your word is to me more than necessary food. And like the prophet, I've eaten your word and it's sweet. So we thank God. Be thankful. Let us be thankful to God that we are able to read the scriptures and make sense of it. That we are able, that God has opened our eyes. It's not, it's not something of our doing. It's a work of God. There is no way you and I 
intellectually or mentally can come to any conclusion that Jesus Christ is Lord. None. None. Jesus is walking with his disciples for years. These are men who have seen him raise the dead, heal blind, lepros, leprosy, still the storm, teach amazing things. Nobody like him before. And after having experienced all of this, one day he stops and he says, let's do a butt check. Guys, who do men say that I am? You would think that would be a simple answer, wouldn't it? Nobody before has walked on water, raised dead people, do all the things that this man has done. You would think that's, that's going to... Whom do men say I am? No one is answering. And then Peter begins to stutter. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, you know, some people say you're Jeremiah. Some people say they think you're Isaiah. Some people say you're one of the prophets. And Jesus says, okay, mouth man, who do you say I am? And then Peter made a stunning confession. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And what was Jesus' response? You did not determine this on your own. That's what he meant when he said, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Paul says, no man calls Jesus Lord except by the Holy Ghost. No man calls Jesus Lord except by the Holy Ghost. So let us thank God. Thank God that he's opened our understanding to heavenly things. Amen. Third, be thankful for a heavenly father who hears our prayers. Amen. Lazarus's burial site, Jesus lifted his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe you sent me. You always hear me. I thank you that you have heard me. I thank you. Many of us, we pray, it's easy to pray, calling God for this and that. But how often do we stop to say, Father, you know, I have a lot of things in my heart today. But today, I just want to give you thanks. Hmm? The impulse is always, we're always so laden with needs that the moment we get into prayer, it's like we have this long list waiting. And we just open up to God, we just thank you. But the back of minds is like, ah, this long list waiting to come before God. How about sometimes we just say, God, I have lots of needs, many things pressing upon my heart. But I know you know all those things. So today, I just want to give you praise. I want to give you praise for things that I have. I want to give you praise for things like this, that God, with 8 billion people in this world, a handful are saved, and I'm among them. Not of works that I've done, but by your grace and your mercy, you have rescued me. Nothing that I deserve. I thank you. What about thanking God every day for just being able to walk? How many of you know a lot of people can't walk? Hmm? A lot of people can't walk. A lot of people are scrounging uh, for a meal. A lot of people are 
I was reading the other day, this um, girl just had a baby, and she's running. Uh, she's, she's running and entering for a marathon, like four or five months after her baby was born, and then somebody was interviewing her and saying, why are you running? And her answer is, was very simple and profound. She said, I run because I can. I run because I can. She's implying a lot of people can't even move. A lot can't even walk. I run because I can. I think when we think about the simple things of life, we sang a song earlier that I give you praise because of the breath in my lungs. It belongs to you. We live and move and have our being in God. We, we are surviving because he sustains us. So instead of sometimes of just looking at what we don't have, let us be thankful for what we do have. Amen. We have the love of God. We have salvation and inheritance in eternal life. We have a God who loves us, who cares for us, who knows what we're going through, and he is with us. He's promised to be with us. He will not necessarily take us out of every, for every fire. Jesus, the fourth man, could have delivered those three Hebrew boys from that furnace, but he did not deliver them. He joined them. So even in the midst of our suffering and hardship, we can be sure that I will be with you always, even to the end of this age. He's with us. Amen. Praise God. And once he's with us, the fire will not overcome us. The fire is there for a purpose. It is to take the things from us that bind us. Do you notice what happened after they came out of the furnace? The Bible says the fire did not singe their hair. If you go through fire, the first thing that happens is your hair frazzles and, and disappears, burns up. Their hair wasn't touched. The smell of smoke was not on their garment. But watch how selective this fire was. It burned the ropes that bound their hands and feet. How else could they be walking in the furnace with Jesus? Amen. Amen. So sometimes God does not deliver us from the furnace, but he will be with us in it. That's the assurance we have. When you go through the waters, they will not overflow you. The rivers, when you go through the fire, they will not burn. It will not burn you. The Lord has given us this promise. And finally, be thankful for Jesus, sacrifice of himself for our salvation. Amen. Amen. And we have this here, uh, another giving of thanks. We celebrate communion every first Sunday of the month. And one of the things we do is we emulate the sacrament Jesus initiated and which he asked us to do here until he returns. But look at what he did. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it. Notice again, just like the five loaves and the seven loaves, he blessed, then broke. Right? And gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup. And maybe a miracle of expansion and multiplication took place here as well. Unless that was a very big loaf of bread. You have 12 strapping men eating a loaf of bread. And those people ate. They ate. The communion for them was a substantial thing, not the little wafers we have. I went to this, we went to this church on 293 at Boulevard next door at their dedication of their church building. An Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, and they were having communion 
um, in their mass as, as the communion is being served. We are sitting there. I don't know how many of you were with me that day. But we're sitting there, and they put a big loaf of bread in my hand. And I'm like, okay, is this for the whole bench? <laughs> and everybody had a big loaf. And all the children were eating and eating their loaf. And that's probably a little more symbolic. But um, Jesus blessed, he broke it, gave to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Um, and this is, so it is a gratitude that every time we gather, at least for communion, we remember um, how God loved us to the point where he would give himself one of the challenges that we have in our world today is a problem of self-confidence, a lack of self-confidence, a lack of self-esteem. Um, many suffer from uh, these inferiority complexes, and it hinders us. Um, it makes us speak to ourselves, put away, and so on. But if you really want to know what is your value, don't look at the tag at the back of your dress or your shirt. That's not your value. Your value is the life of God's Son. Amen. That is your value. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son for me. I am worth Jesus. You are worth Jesus. He died for you. He died for me. And as someone said, if you were the only sinner in the world, Jesus would have done no less than gone to the cross to rescue you from death and hell. You're worth Jesus. You're worth the life of the Son of God. If you want to see a price tag, or put a price tag, or a value on yourself, that's what you should see. When you look at yourself in the mirror, look at yourself. Your worth is not dependent on the makeup or your clothing or any of it. You look at yourself in the mirror and say, I am worth Jesus. For me, God said, left heaven to come and to suffer and die for me. And if that cannot boost your self-esteem, if that cannot break the chains of your inferiority complexes, if that cannot boost your self-confidence, nothing else can. To know that God values you to the point where he knows the number of hair on my head. A number that probably changes every time I just pass my hand through my ear. He keeps tabs. That's the kind of interest God has in you. Love that surpasses all knowledge. Love incomprehensible. Paul says God wants you to know the love of God that passes all knowledge. Isn't that an amazing statement? He wants you to know the love that passes knowing, that passes all knowledge. The length and the breadth and the height and the depth of the love of God. Hallelujah. And so today, let me conclude. Thanksgiving is more than a celebration for a day. It is a way of life that transcends our economic, social, financial, or moral states. It is predicated on the ground that life is sacred and we are privileged to be a part of a cosmic community sustained by God's breath and upheld by his love. Gratitude is grounded in a reality that says no matter how bad things get, it can become worse. If you are healthy, Google says that you are better off than 95% of the world's population. If you have a roof over your head and three meals a day, you are better off than 700 million people who are steeped in deep poverty. 
If you can walk, be happy. Seven to five million people need a wheelchair daily. If you can run a mile, you will feed 80% of the world's population in a race. If you can read, be thankful, more than 60 million of children of primary school age are not in school because of civil conflicts and poverty that require them to join the workforce. Don't be miserable. Don't be discontented. Be thankful, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. May God bless you. Let's all stand. Hallelujah.